Hello all and welcome to Stingray Toms Florida and another Amazing 10 video. In this series I'm covering the history and nature of Florida in brief stories. Today is about 10 of Florida's lighthouses. These 10 are some of the historic lights in Florida as well as some of the most easily visited. While there are many differences between each of the lights, the most important fact is that they all saved lives throughout their working life. I'll cover more of Florida's lights in future videos, but this will serve as an introduction. Enjoy. I'll start with one of the most impressive lights. Located on Naval Air Station Pensacola, the Pensacola Light's official black over white strikes a dramatic pose. The black covers the top two-thirds of the 150-foot or 46-meter tower, and it's crowned by a viewing platform directly below the lantern room. While 150 feet is impressive, especially for a masonry tower completed in 1858, the Pensacola Light is unusual in that it also rests on a natural 40-foot or 12-meter hill. This overall height, which is known as the focal height, is the difference between sea level and the lantern, and it makes it the tallest light in Florida at 190 feet. The Pensacola Light, which was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1974, is generally open to the public. It's located near one of the largest aircraft museums in the world, the National Museum of Naval Aviation. The light can be seen from Santa Rosa Island, the barrier island protecting Pensacola. The ruins of Fort Pickens on Santa Rosa Island in the Gulf Islands National Seashore is an excellent place to see the light. You might even get to see the Navy's Blue Angels practice while you're there. Next on this list, we can head directly east to the oldest light in the state, one situated near Florida's border with Georgia, north of Jacksonville. Known as the Amelia Island Light, it's tucked into a residential neighborhood. Built in 1838, it's one of the oldest buildings in Florida as well as its oldest lighthouse. The location of the light protects the mouth of both the St. Mary's and Amelia Rivers that meet near the inlet to the ocean. The water here marks the division between Florida and Georgia. The light is on Amelia Island next to Egan's Creek, a tributary of the Amelia River. The white masonry structure with a black lantern room is 64 feet or 20 meters tall and, like Pensacola, it rests on a hill which gives it a focal point of 107 feet or 33 meters. The property and structures are currently owned by the city of Fernandino Beach and the grounds are occasionally open to the public, but as of 2021 visitors aren't allowed to climb it. One of the best places to see it is directly across Egan's Creek on the grounds of the Fort Clinch State Park. After entering the park, there is a viewing area on the left side of the road that leads to a boardwalk overlooking the creek. You'll see the light there. The next light to explore is in Key West. It's one of the most visited lights in the state, even if it's on a small island that's more than a 100 mile drive from mainland Florida. Key West Light is one of the few Florida lighthouses located in the midst of a city. Finished in 1848, the light started service at a height of 50 feet or 15 meters on land that was about 15 feet or 5 meters above sea level. In 1894, it was increased to a height of 73 feet or 22 meters to keep it above the tree line. Yes, that's a real issue in Florida. The Key West Arts and Historical Society operates the light as the Key West Lighthouse and Keeper's Quarters Museum, and the property is tucked into a historic residential neighborhood filled with lush tropical vegetation which keeps the light hidden until you're nearly on top of it. As can be seen, it's a standard masonry tower painted white with black lantern room, much like the Amelia Island light. Heading due north, we arrive at another island, though this one is much closer to the mainland. 
we'll look at two lights which are as different from each other as they are from the common brick tower style we've looked at so far. Named for the mythical pirate Jose Gaspar, Gasparilla Island marks the entrance to the important Charlotte Harbor. The two lights that still remain are the Port Boca Grande light and the Gasparilla Island light. The Gasparilla Island light was designed as one of a pair of range lights. The other was located about a mile offshore. To navigate, sailors would position their ships so that the two range lights lined up. That told them it was safe to turn to enter Boca Grande Pass. The Gasparilla Island Light started its life over a thousand miles away as the Delaware Breakwater Range Rear Light. It was built in 1881, but in 1927 it was reassembled on Gasparilla Island, though it didn't enter service until 1932. Located not far from the high water line, the tower is a 105 foot or 32 meter tall metal tubular structure with a supportive exoskeleton. In 2014, it was decommissioned by the Coast Guard and control of the light was given to the Barrier Islands Parks Society. As of 2018, a replica Fresnel lens was put in and relit. It's located next to the beach and is on the island's main north-south road. About a mile and a half south sits Gasparilla Island's other light, the Port Boca Grande light. It's one of the shortest lights in Florida, as its lantern room is mounted on the roof of the lightkeeper's house. The house sits on iron pilings at the southernmost point of the island. Next to the house is a nearly identical house that was once the home of the assistant lightkeeper. As lightkeeper jobs go, these were pretty good ones. The two houses are frame-built, two-story structures, raised off the ground about 10 feet or 3 meters to limit storm surge caused by hurricanes. The light is in a cupola at the 44-foot or 13-meter height. The house is white with a brown roof, white cupola, and a black lantern room. The light was activated in 1890 and deactivated in 1966, and the buildings were left to the elements. Lee County took possession of the site in 1972, and the erosion issues were addressed. 1980 saw it placed on the National Register of Historic Places, and restoration work began in 1985. In 1988, Gasparilla Island State Park was established. The museum, which fills much of the lighthouse, has an interesting narrative of the history of the light, plus information about Gasparilla Island. Both houses are beautiful and excellent examples of late 19th century architecture. They include broad porches, working shutters, and a widow's walk on the cupola. Heading back over to the Atlantic coast, we'll stop by the Daytona Beach area to explore Ponce de Leon Inlet Light. Standing as the tallest in Florida, the light at Ponce de Leon Inlet is also the third tallest in the U.S., it was built in 1887 to protect what was once known as Mosquito Inlet. It tops out at 175 feet or 53 meters and is painted a distinctive red brick color with black lantern room and catwalk. The inlet was renamed for the Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon in 1927. The light was deactivated in 1970 for a new light at New Smyrna Beach, though in 1982 it was made active again partly because of a new high-rise condo blocking the Coast Guard's replacement light. Yes, that makes the Ponce Inlet light a replacement of the light that replaced it. In 1972, the light and its property were turned over to the town of Ponce Inlet, the same year it was put on the National Register of Historic Places. The facility today is a great place to learn about lights and the lighthouse service. It's one of four lights on Florida's Atlantic coast that are regularly open for visitors to climb. One of the best things to see at the Ponce Inlet Light is the collection of lenses on display in their museum. The impressive collection sheds light on the history of the different type structures used to focus and amplify life-saving lights the world over. If we wanted to head west towards Pensacola, there are a few lights we could visit on the trip. For instance, on St. George Island at the mouth of the Apalachicola River stands the Cape St. George Light. Completed originally in 1848, this light is a true survivor, having collapsed and been rebuilt not once, but twice. 
Standing 72 feet or 22 meters high, it's one of Florida's oldest lights. But when only a few years old, two hurricanes in 1850 and 51 undermined the foundation and toppled it. Luckily, the first rebuild was done properly, and this time the light lasted until 2005. Like so many of Florida's lights, it's a masonry structure painted white with a black top. Over the years, several storms damaged the foundation and necessitated repairs until the light collapsed once again. This happened well after the Coast Guard decommissioned it, so it took locals to rebuild it. By 2008, the project was complete, and today the light is the centerpiece of a park well away from the beach and hopefully safe for another 150 years. Taking the quiet roads that follow Florida's Big Bend east and south, we get to Anne Cloak Key's light. This isolated light is one of the skeletal lights of the Gulf Coast and is a true survivor as well. Built in 1887, the 102 foot or 31 meter light is located on Anclote Key just west of the Anclote River and the city of Tarpon Springs. The key is only accessible by boat, but even casual visitors can get a closer glimpse of the light by taking one of the Tarpon Springs boat tours to beach on Anclote Key. The light is little but a skeleton, comprising of a central tube that houses the staircase and a perimeter support structure. Currently, the tower is brown, while the lantern at the top is black. After deactivation, the light and land were added to Anclote Key's Preserve State Park. As mentioned, the only access is by boat, either personal or by way of a tour boat out of Tarpon Springs. The light itself isn't open, and there aren't any facilities. Moving from an isolated location to yet another light in a residential neighborhood, we find ourselves near Florida's oldest city, St. Augustine, and Anastasia Island. Along with the Key West light, this is probably the most visited light in Florida, knowing the sheer numbers of visitors to the oldest city in the U.S. It's also the only light in Florida to be painted in a helix pattern, with black and white stripes curving around the tower. Much like Key West, it's hard to see it unless you're on its grounds or if you're looking from a distance, such as across the riverbank in the city. The St. Augustine Light is both the second tallest in Florida at 165 feet or 50 meters and has the second highest focal length at 162 feet or 49 meters. It was built in 1874, replacing a series of towers and beacons going back to the 16th century. The light is located near Anastasia State Park on the island and was placed there to make the inlet safe for navigation. It's another one of the four lights on Florida's Atlantic coast that is open to the public. And we'll wrap up with possibly my favorite Florida light, the light at Jupiter Inlet. Like the lights at Pensacola and Amelia Island, the Jupiter Inlet light was built on a hill. For years, the story was that the hill was made by humans, a midden, essentially a trash mound of pre-Columbian indigenous people. These midden are common throughout the coastal areas of Florida and typically contain shells of clams and other shellfish, animal bones, and parts of broken tools. However, archaeological work at Jupiter has shown this one to be simply a sand dune. This natural hill allows the 105-foot or 32-meter tower to rise to 153 feet or 47 meters, making it one of the highest focal lengths in the state. The light was completed in 1860 and is constructed of brick and painted a brick red with a black lantern room. It shares property with the military. The military installation performed several functions over the years, with its most notable contribution happening during World War II when the Navy set up a station to intercept German submarine radio messages. The facility was able to aid in the sinking of dozens of U-boats. In '73, the property, including the light, was placed on the National Register of Historic Places, and it continues to operate as a museum. The tower is open to the public. There are a total of 30 official lights in Florida. Those are ones that are, or once were, managed by the U.S. Coast Guard. I'm sure I'll do another Amazing 10 video on ones that aren't official. So let me know in the comments which of these Florida lights you find the most amazing, 
and which ones have you visited? Thanks again for watching another Stingray Tom's Florida video. Please like and subscribe and check out my other videos. I'd appreciate it. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.